welcome everyone today. Um, we have a very good turnout. I think we'll go ahead and get started. That way we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, we are proud to have Dr. Carlos Morea as our guest speaker today. He joined the Apollo Surgical Medical Specialties in September of 2019. He graduated from Temple University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Morea completed his surgical internship at the Naval Medical Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. He completed his residency in orthopedic surgery at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia. He completed his fellowship in orthopedic sports medicine at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. Dr. Morea is board certified in orthopedic surgery and is a member of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery Fellows. In addition to seeing patients in his office, Dr. Morea is on call for emergencies and sees patients in Jackson Hospital's emergency department as needed. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Morea. Thank you very much, Joe, for that great introduction. And uh, thank you for the uh, foundation for inviting me to speak today. Um, so today's topic, uh, it's called Take Charge of Your Health. Now there's so much stuff to talk about, so as I prepared for this talk, I had to narrow down the, uh, the, uh, the lecture, so uh, let's just get started. I have no disclosures. I have no stocks in any medical companies, pharmaceutical, or anything like that. Uh, also, my views are my own. Uh, I don't speak for the Navy or for the Department of Defense since I'm under service in the U.S. Navy. Um, so why this subject, and why is an orthopedic talk, surgeon talking about uh, uh, chronic disease? Well, let me just tell you what happened this week. So the other day, Monday, uh, when I did a clinic, about 73% of the patients that I saw in the office were either in the office because of chronic disease, or causing an orthopedic condition, or an orthopedic condition exacerbated by chronic disease. So it's really the main reason why I see patients in the office, at the orthopedic office. I'm not a primary care provider. Um, six in 10 adults have chronic disease, and four in 10 have two, at least two or more. Uh, chronic disease will include things like obesity, uh, hypertension, type two diabetes, uh, arthritis, cancer, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, the CDC data shows that basically back in the 1990s, you know, the, the rate of obesity started skyrocketing here. Well, why is that? Uh, back in the 70s, the Senate community decided that, uh, well, we have to kind of make some dietary uh, recommendations. Uh, and it looks like the, atherosclerosis, uh, the atherosclerosis plaques uh, are mostly lipids, so therefore the problem must be fat. So they started recommending people to go on a low-fat diet. Uh, but it turns out that even though the nation has been eating less fat uh, the last few decades, the rate of obesity has increased. The rate of type 2 diabetes has increased. So really, the problem seems to not be fat, but there seems to, there seems to be another reason for the problem. Um, so also, why, why this talk? Because. And then this is the most political slide that I'm going to have here after this, no more politics. But, um, you know, there's a lot of debate in the country regarding healthcare, you know, access to healthcare. Uh, and, but access to healthcare doesn't necessarily make us healthier. I have worked in patient populations where access to healthcare is free, but yet there are some of the uh, most unhealthy patient populations that I'm taking care of. So, the two are not necessarily the same. And so we have a passion for healthcare, but we seem to have lost or have no passion for health. And I think it's a key difference. So the difference is really to prevent and to just optimize our health in order to avoid having to have access to healthcare. Uh, so in between the battle between healthcare and health, I would choose to help any time of the day. All right. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem really for, for, for the reason for chronic disease is uh, visceral adipose tissue or visceral fat. And what is that? That's the fat that surrounds our abdominal organs, okay? It's not really the fat that's underneath our skin. It's not really the love handle. It's really the central obesity, or so-called the beer gut. That is, that is the worst fat we have in the body. 
and is the cause, one of the primary causes for uh, atherosclerotic plaques, heart attack, strokes, uh, and other problems of inflammation in the body, including osteoarthritis. So how do we go about managing this? Well, the, the problem, the, the main culprit here is actually sugar. So it's really not fat. Well, it's not what well, I would call the good fats. Now, I, I think for now we should probably forget about what we have learned that is good fat and, uh, and bad fat. Uh, I think the only consensus is, is that trans fatty acids are bad. You don't really have to worry about them anymore because the FDA banned them. Uh, but uh, the problem is sugar. And is sugar what fuels a lot of these chronic diseases? Okay. Um, and how do we go up about controlling that? Well, you might have heard of the ketogenic diet or intermittent fasting. Uh, the, the goal is basically to uh, have a diet that is lower in carbohydrates. See, back in the old times when people were just hunting and gathering, they were not eating bread, pasta, muffins, cookies, crackers, and chips, none of that stuff. They would only eat what, what they would hunt or what they would gather. So it was a diet that was much lower in carbohydrates, and it was a diet that was essentially devoid of any processed foods. Uh, other things that we can uh, uh, do to improve our uh, decrease our visceral fat and improve our health is to improve our microbiome. What is exactly this microbiome? Well, it refers to the bacteria that live in our gut. Uh, so our, our intestines are full of millions of bacteria, but some of them can be good and some of them can be bad. Okay, so basically probiotics, right? Um, back when I was in medical school, you know, for instance, this is just an example, I, I learned that uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, which is a type of bacteria, can cause a lot of infections who are alcoholics. I never really understood why, but you know now we know that that's a bacteria that makes and thrives in an environment of alcohol. Okay, um, so but there are also bacteria that are good, and so we have to kind of you know uh, basically supplement our diets with foods that will make the good bacteria thrive and not make the bad bacteria thrive. Other things that can be helpful will be high intensity interval training. Okay, uh, obviously you have clearance from your own doctor before pursuing this. Uh, yeah, from an exercise standpoint, to decrease visceral fat, it's better to do high intensity interval training than it is to do long, long uh, like, uh, aerobic exercise such as jogging. Okay, I love jogging, I've been jogging for pretty much all my life, but it's really not necessarily the best exercise. I, from a visceral fat standpoint, uh, uh, you know, high intensity interval training uh, kind of more anaerobic exercise can be better for that. Other things that can be helpful could be saunas and cold showers with the production of what is called heat shock proteins and cold shock proteins, uh, and then exposure to sun and just making endogenous vitamin D. Um, now, this is, these are two MRIs. I know these people. I know that the, both of the people on this MRI, okay? On the right side, we have somebody who, uh, this diet has consisted of very low carbohydrates, high intensive interval training, all these other things that I just mentioned. And the other one is somebody with a more sedentary lifestyle. Both of them look like skinny people. And I, I've met both of them. Uh, one of them is a good friend of mine. But if you look at this MRI, um, right, I don't think that there's a light here. Right. If you look at the MRI here, these are, this is the abdominal contents here. All this stuff in black, it's either muscles, like the, uh, I think I didn't know it was a So it would be like the, uh, the, the psoas muscle, or it could be the intestines. The, the stuff in white is really visceral fat, this part right here. This is the subcutaneous fat, the one in the middle is the visceral fat, and that's the fat that's bad. So just because somebody is skinny, doesn't mean that they don't carry visceral fat in their body. Okay, uh, is, is it possible to play a video? Here or no? Okay, I need this video to be played, please. Of course, I don't have.
right now. Sweet Jeremy has lost a lot of weight going on your low carbohydrate diet with only 15 grams of sugar a day or less. So right now he's in a pretty healthy state, losing weight, losing visceral fat. Uh, they draw his blood and the cells look back completely healthy, the red blood cells. Cells form what is called the wall. They start clumping together. They have difficult, difficulty or are not able to pass the capillaries, so they have uh, decreased ability to get oxygen to their tissues. looked at the uh, rodents, you know, mice in New York City, and uh, they have type 2 diabetes because they're eating the junk food without really being high enough. So we could go over this, <coughs> sure. uh, You know, but the suburban rats don't have that problem, just the ones in New York City, because that's what they're eating. Uh, I mean, one or two years ago, you know, there was this, like, uh, the pizza rat, so they, they, somebody filmed it, or the, the, a little rat carrying on around it a slice of pizza from a subway station. So that, that's the kind of food that they're eating. So they have type 2 diabetes. See, what happens when you eat uh, a large carbohydrate though? You have a sugar spike, and then you have an insulin spike as a result of that in order for the body to process the sugar. Now, when you eat sugar uh, or carbohydrates, some of that becomes glycogen. Glycogen is like the way that the body can store uh, glucose. Uh, it, was, it will do it in the muscles, it will do it in the liver. Although the glycogen stores are gonna store pretty quickly. Any excess sugar, any excess carbohydrate is gonna become fat. And a lot of it, it becomes visceral fat, which is a really type, bad, bad type of fat. Uh, it's something that applies to my feel, okay? Uh, you know, osteoarthritis, uh, for the most part, is it, really uh, caused from is caused by just basically mechanical failure of the joints, okay? The load on the cartilage is more than the, the compressive forces that the proteoglycans of the cartilage are able to withstand. But now we can see that with insulin, with insulin spikes, it actually elicits inflammation 
on the synovial side, on so the cells that secrete fluid in the joint. So now we don't have, we don't just have a mechanical reason for osteoarthritis, we have a biochemical reason for osteoarthritis. These are other studies. Uh, this one's from the New England Journal of Medicine looking at glucose levels and risk of dementia. And then they concluded that you know sugar is bad for dementia and can lead to dementia, even in patients who are not diabetic. So the absolute worst thing we can do at a nursing home is to be giving you know cookies and candies and things like that to, to our, our elderly patients. Um, so it's not just for our diabetics, but this applies basically to everybody. Um, Diet and psychosis has been related to. So they, you know, diets that are refined in carbohydrates and high in fat, but some of these being bad fats, uh, found to cause uh, uh, more like psychotic type of uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, so the old paradigm that I learned in medical school, and I went to medical school back in the 90s, is that diabetes or type two diabetes is treatable and manageable. Uh, Manageable meaning, well, you know, we'll, we'll kind of keep your sugar sort of like in, in, under control. Uh, and if the patient is, high, you know, has high, a mild hyperglycemia, you know, just mild diabetes, then with dietary changes, you know, you can help that, you can control it. But if you go if the sugars are fairly high, then you have to go into medications. So then you give oral hypoglycemia medications and then use insulin for rescue. But that's the old paradigm. The new paradigm is that type 2 diabetes is preventable. Type 2 diabetes is reversible, although not the end organ damage. If you, if you already have end organ damage, it's too late for that. And that type 2 diabetes is curable, okay? Uh, people come off their medications, okay? Uh, if you don't believe me, you can go to that site, Verta Health. Basically, it's a company that they reverse type 2 diabetes uh, with no medications, and uh, it's actually, they don't even charge for treating you. They only they don't they only collect money if you're actually being successful. And so companies who have a lot of employees that have to take time off to go to the doctors or because they have other health problems, they're actually saving money because their their employees with type two diabetes are being cured. And part of that savings is then what the what the company will charge. Uh, even the president of the American Diabetes Association is on a low carbohydrate diet, and she's been able to come off her insulin. Okay, this, you know, she mentioned this on a podcast. You can, you can Google this or look it up on YouTube. So type 2 diabetes is a man-made disease. It's really not something you just like have bad luck in your head. It's really related to our diet. Uh, but the problem is, is that we have is our standard American diet. It's a diet that is very high in carbohydrates, processed foods, sugar, and uh, also bad fats, and I'll discuss what bad, bad fats is. I mean, that looks like a typical thing that we might eat, you know, eat when we go out, or uh, some of those items you might even have for breakfast. Um, and that's the culprit. So, what is the ketogenic diet? It's uh, different versions of it. I mean, uh, if you follow Twitter, there's always battles between the carnivores versus just the low carb, but in, in essence, uh, the ketogenic diet is one where uh, your body starts forming ketone bodies as the source of energy. It runs out of glucose, it runs out of glycogen, then it, it breaks down fat in order to provide energy uh, for, for, you know, for the tissues, including for the brain. Uh, the red blood cells do function in glucose, uh, but the body still has uh, ways to uh, manufacture uh, glucose from uh, what is called gluconeogenesis. So you can take some proteins and turn them into glucose. Um, so let me give you some examples of uh, success stories of ketogenic diet, okay? And intermittent fasting, which will put you in a, what I call a ketogenic uh, state. Uh, uh, retired uh, all-pro offensive lineman Joe Thomas from the Cleveland Browns. He went into a keto, uh, ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting and uh, for exercise he did swimming. He looked a lot better on the right after he retired from the NFL, I'll tell you that for sure. And uh, people were commenting that he probably should go back to playing football and playing as a linebacker. Um, this is a 68 year old man who stopped eating processed foods and carbohydrates. He didn't exercise one bit. There's no exercise at all. And look at the slides from the top left the bottom right. Yes, it decreases the, uh, the subcutaneous fat, which is on yellow. 
but more importantly, he's also decreasing the visceral fat, the visceral adipose tissue, which is on red. Okay, you can see, uh, you, you know, he's got more muscle. Uh, you can see more of the intestines, but less of that visceral fat on the bottom right than you can on the top left, and that's just after 35 weeks. Here's another example: a 58-year-old uh, gentleman with a complete occlusion of the left middle cerebral artery. Without any medications, with just dietary changes, lifestyle changes, he turned that nine months into this, wide open. Okay, that, that, that should speak volumes. So that's in less than a year. Okay, with no medications. So, and the ketogenic diets have also helped in the remission of psychotic symptoms. Okay, that's actually being reported right now. And I think a lot of that also has to do with cha changing our microbiome bacteria in our gut. Uh, here's a study showing that uh, lactobacillus ruteri, which is one, one form of uh, probiotic, can also help increase, increase inflammation. Uh, if you're asking, where can I get that? Well, it's like, actually, you can get it at Windexia and uh, at Walmart. If you buy the keeper milk, you can read the label and it'll have that in this, this list as one of the ingredients. So how do we go about this? All right, so this is basically what's on your handout here. The most important thing to do is eliminate sugar, okay? And to eliminate or drastically decrease any variation, so whether it's high fructose corn syrup or just corn syrup, cane sugar, fructose, derivatives, etc., whatever the name is. Sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the food companies, they get smart and they just use different type of sugars so that that least of those <laughs> ingredients are towards the bottom of the ingredient list, as opposed to for it to be like you know the top one or the second one. So you gotta read the labels though, uh, and I'll show you some examples later on. Uh, usually, you know things that we're not considered as sweet, like just regular white bread. Usually, you know sugar is like the second or the third ingredient. Okay, eliminate or drastically decrease a processed foods. Okay, uh, the less processing, the better. Okay. Eliminate unhealthy fats. Uh, I don't go too much into saying, well, this, you know, saturated fats are bad or saturated fats are good. Uh, I think that's the, the jury is out. It's, it's still out on that. Uh, here's what I would call unhealthy fats: uh, highly processed oils like canola oils, vegetable oils. Now, vegetable oils are usually industrial seed oils. So, vegetable oil is not good. Okay, and that's probably what we're using most of the time. Uh, trans fatty acids, uh, you don't really have to worry too much about that because the FDI already banned them. Consume a diet that is low in carbohydrates. Whether you go ketogenic or you know, truly ketogenic, you know, it's up to you. Whether you actually go fasting, that's up to you. I fast when my business really, my clinic is really busy and I have no time for lunch. So it's actually good to be busy. Uh, because it's really hard to fast at will when you have the time to eat lunch. Uh, Sweet potato is okay, but in moderation, but it has a lower glycemic index than white potato. White potato is not good, okay? Uh, consume more natural and organic foods, okay? Now, there are two camps of this. Some people say, well, there's no evidence that uh, that, GM, that non-GMO food is gonna be better, uh, or uh, there's no evidence that organic food is better. Well, that may be true, although there's a lot of things for which there is no evidence, but that it may still be clinically relevant. To me, it does not make sense to eat a lot of things that are highly processed or that might have chemicals in them. At the very least, think about fruits that are not organic, all the pesticides that they probably used in order to, you know, uh, keep, keep the, you know, you know, keep the insects away. So, uh, if you buy, let's say, fruits and vegetables that are not necessarily organic, <coughs> one way you can do, one thing you can do is to just basically soak them in baking soda first to try to wash away some of the pesticides. Uh, Consuming grass-fed beef, okay, even if it's not grass-fed, and I understand grass-fed beef is expensive, and you can't really find it everywhere, uh, but it does have better ratios of, of omega-3 fatty acids, which is better than omega-6 fatty acids, than, than like, than like uh, grain-fed uh, beef. Uh, consume cold water, wild-caught seafood. This would be things like wild-caught salmon, all right, uh, mackerel, sardines, things of that nature. Um, again, wild cod has better ratios of omega-3 fatty acids, the good ones, than, than the ones that are uh, that are farm-fed, okay, or like farm-raised. Uh, 
uh, and consumption of healthy fats. Uh, I love extra virgin olive oil. I use it every single day. Uh, the only problem with, there's only two problems with uh, olive oil. One number one is it has a low smoke point, so it's really not the best thing to fry anything on or cook, uh, because that can change the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the molecular, molecular content. Uh, the other thing is, is, this has been documented, you can look it up on YouTube, uh, 60 Minutes did a documentary on fake olive oils coming from Italy. Uh, the mafia has a hold on this industry too, and they call it agro-mafia where uh, the majority of olive oils that are brought to the United States that you see in the supermarket are actually fake olive oils. They either have been diluted with other oils like seed oils, like no oil or some form, or they might even add a chlorophyll to them to make them look more green. Uh, so personally, I just buy a Spanish one, uh, and uh, I try to stay away from the brands that you know, could, be, uh, could not be pure olive oil. Uh, Grass-fed butter, uh, I'll consider it as a healthy, saturated type of fat. Avocado olive, uh, oil is very good, okay, and it has a very high smoke point, so it's actually good for for a stir fry or, or, or for frying, for cooking. Uh, coconut oil, as long as it's organic and not refined, uh, is also good. Uh, it will it will kind of give you a taste of coconut, you know, through scrambled eggs. So I usually just use the butter or avocado oil for that. Um, Consume fermented foods, okay? Things like uh, kefir milk, all right? Uh, what is that? That's actually kind of like a, it's like a liquid yogurt, really. It's fermented milk. You can do yogurt also. And then fruits and vegetables like kimchi or sauerkraut. All right, why fermented foods? Because all these things, they help to uh, increase uh, the amount of good bacteria to your gut, okay? Um, now, the only thing is for yogurt, as you saw in the video, he was eating yogurt on that video. Well. A lot, most yogurts have sugar added on them. So you really should probably stay away from the ones that have sugar on them. So again, read the labels. Um, and then there is also anti-inflammatory supplements that you can do like, like turmeric, ginger, cod liver, fish oil, the long, the list is long. Uh, that's the up-to-date list that I have. And it's, it should have, you should have one in front of you. Uh, so where do we start here? Well, the two places for us to start, okay. One here is, is here at the hospital, okay. Um, to update our menus. I have worked, I used to travel for work, so I've worked in many places. I worked in the hospitals in North Dakota, Arizona, Florida, uh, Michigan, uh, Indiana. Uh, first time I did my training in Pennsylvania. And I can tell you that even for diabetic patients, the, the option that's available uh, is something called the consistent carbohydrate diet, which to me doesn't really make sense. The, the theory is, is that if you give the patient a consistent amount of carbohydrate, then you can figure out how much medication they're going to require, particularly for the insulin. But I mean, the analogy uh, of that is, it's like me telling you that your car has a chronic condition called dirty car, but I'm going to give you a consistent amount of dirt so we can figure out how much soap and water you're going to need to wash your car on a daily basis. It doesn't make any sense to me. We need to stop decrease, we need to start decreasing the amount of carbohydrates that we're giving to our patients, especially our diabetic patients. Uh, so I think in general, the hospitals in America will have to just revisit their menus and update them. Uh, you know, I've had patients, one-on-ones, -on that have been in the hospital for five days, and their diabetes, their sugars are still out of control. Five days as an inpatient, and their sugars are still out of control. That has to change. So update our menus, uh, have at the very least an option for a low carbohydrate uh, meal. Eliminate fruit juice, mashed potatoes, and rolls, and things like that that are full of carbohydrates from the trays, especially for our diabetic patients. Uh, less processed food and include fermented foods, especially for those patients who are either in antibiotics or have a history of uh, some sort of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's uh, or you know, it's, it's good to just help their microbiome to not just treat them with antibiotics, which are gonna kill a lot of the good bacteria, but actually give them the good bacteria. So I think fermented food, particularly for those patients where antibiotics are very important. And the other place where we can start is at, is at our homes, okay? When we go shopping to the supermarket. A diet is hard to start at home. A diet starts at the supermarket. Um, so how do we go about that? Well. 
try not to go to the supermarket hungry. That helps. That's a, it's been fun. A lot of people will tell you that when they go to supermarket hungry, they will just buy whatever they like. You know? uh, so make the list, or just you know, I'll tell yourself, I'm just going to buy healthy food. I'm not going to go just window shopping. You know, uh, read the labels so that you know that you're not buying something that has all these added sugar. Um, and then drink lots of water. Um, the body doesn't really tell very well the difference between being hungry and being thirsty. Uh, in addition, that uh, thirst is not a very good indication of dehydration. All right. Uh, so one thing to do is just drink water all the time. And if you're hungry, drink water. If you're still hungry, then maybe it's time to eat something. Right? Uh, always include uh, water as part of your meal. So here's, uh, here's what, and even when we go to the supermarket, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to buy some fruits and vegetables, and I'm going to stay away from processed food. Part of the problem is that the, the, you know, the fruits that we can buy at supermarkets are, are all these hybrid kinds that are supposed to be just bigger, plumber, more juice, more, more, uh, more sugar on them. This slide compares wild grapes with store-bought grapes. I mean, look at the difference. The ones on the left. Are, they're not as sweet, they're more tart, they just have more flavor on them. The other ones are just sugar bombs. And those are the ones, but that's the ones that you see in the supermarket. So you gotta have to keep that in mind. Even, even when it comes to buying fruits, you might have to stay away from some of them. Uh, I'll give you some like, quick examples here. Cornflakes, this is a regular trip to the supermarket. Um, and uh, since I'm on my computer, I'm gonna speak from here. What are the ingredients here? So we have, Rice, I'm sorry, corn, second ingredient is sugar, right away. Um, and it's not a cereal that you would think, oh, it's not a frosted flakes, this is just regular corn, but the second ingredient is sugar. Okay, special K protein, ooh, no, it sounds protein, it sounds, uh, sounds pretty healthy. Well, it's gonna have whole wheat, which is obviously carbs, rice, more carbs, wheat, gluten, everybody wants to stay away from gluten these days, and then the fourth ingredient is sugar, okay? Uh, I used, to, I used to eat these every single morning for breakfast. Um, but if you look at the ingredients, whole grain, whole grain oats, and the second ingredient is sugar. Third ingredient is canola, which I already mentioned is not good. So it's already two out of three, not good. And then the first one is, you know, just carbs. Uh, Cheerios, and we all, it says, well, it must be, must be healthy, must be heart healthy. It has there the uh, seal of approval, I think it's from American Heart Association, right? So it must be good. Well, look at that, whole wheat grain, I'm sorry, whole grain oats, cornstarch, and sugar. Okay, ketchup, well, we like to put ketchup and everything, right? Uh, well, it's gonna be tomato concentrate, vinegar, and then it's gonna be sugar. Uh, in this case, it's the high fructose corn syrup. Uh, Skippy, uh, peanut butter, well, this is gonna be peanuts, the second ingredient is sugar. Third ingredient is processed oils, you know, so, uh, not good. Yeah. Pop tarts for boy. This is the killer one. Uh, this one also, I can't really see the other label too well from here, but it's also wheat flour, then sugar. And then there you extra. go. Wheat flour mm -hmm. and sugar, and then more sugars. Yeah. Different type of sugars there too. Wonder bread, right? This is just regular white bread. This is not like the brown sugar kind. Okay. If you read the ingredients, enrich, enrich flour. Uh, I think that it says water and then high fructose corn syrup. Again, the third ingredient. It makes you wonder that, you know. The kind bar, well, they're really not so kind to your health uh, because they have oats and then the second ingredient is cane sugar. So, in summary, uh, chronic disease, uh, it's not just treatable, but it is also preventable, reversible, and curable. And, uh, you know, despite all these markers, you know, cholesterol and things like that, that people try to follow to see if it improves, I really think that the culprit here is to try to lower our visceral fat content, which is related to a lot of inflammatory diseases in the body, and including heart attacks and stroke, things of that nature. So, eliminating sugar from your diet, eliminate or drastically decrease processed foods, focus on a low carb or a ketogenic diet uh, with intermittent.